What do you think of Antarctica? I recommend that anybody who wants to know about Antarctica consider a couple of facts. The first one is all of the nations of the world, which actually, wow, that's an interesting one. Every single nation on the planet agrees on what? Is there anything that the, the whole world agrees on? Holy crap. Surely not. Surely the whole world. No way. What? What does every nation in the world agree on? Oh, wait. Antarctica. And what do they agree? They agree that this place, this, this, this frozen continent down there at the bottom, is so precious because they all care about the environment, right? All the all the nations they they really love them. They see that the earth is like uh, our mother, right? Like surely they wouldn't rape the mother, right? Like surely they wouldn't strip mine chemtrail frack <laughs> cut down the forests or a factory fish or use pesticides. We love the planet too much. Clearly, we need to protect that thing called Antarctica, right? Which, by the way, has tons of fresh water down there if we wanted it like plenty of real fresh water oh no they protect the water so we wouldn't have to worry about drinking the water no. but they all agree on one thing antarctica that treaty there's not one nation in the world that says no 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 we want to explore antarctica we we want to i'm sorry we we, we want to do more than that so that's the first thing if all the nations of the world are agreeing on only one thing that that's at least a unique thing that deserves a bit of investigation and if you really want to jump right into that rabbit hole then you go ahead and watch uh or uh find the actual log of a man named admiral bird and operation high jump you are going to take a first class ticket into alice in wonderland's rabbit hole there big time what i think about antarctica is i believe that the story that admiral bird tells is true <laughs> um so here is the condensed well I, I mean i'll tell you a version you know it won't be the most extensive but I'll, I'll try and do it in a shorter period of time than the actual video you could watch a video that will give you the uh the reading of his log and the context of how we even know this because the only reason why we know this is because uh, Admiral Byrd ended up experiencing what I'm, I'm going to tell you and when he went back to, he was an admiral so he was on a mission and he was the most respected highly decorated like these awards doesn't even come remotely close to what he got right not even not even remotely close. Um, when he went back to report to his superiors at the Pentagon, two years after World War II, two years after we had gone into Germany and basically taken all of their records and everything, right? Everything that was left, everything that wasn't burned, we took it, or the Soviets uh, took it. So it's ironic, and it's not, co it's not a coincidence that two years after World War II ended, 1945, Two years after, in 1947, is this Operation uh, High Tower, High Jump. I can't believe I'm forgetting that. Anyway, it's one of those. <laughs> high Jump, I think, yeah. Anyway, uh, when he went back to his superiors as the top guy in charge of this expedition, he was ordered uh, to keep his mouth shut. Similar to the USS Liberty, by the way, the story I told you uh, earlier, when they went back and told the story about the Israelis, they were all ordered to shut up and nobody said anything until about roughly 20 years later. God bless him at big, big risk, but they were all just like, it was too heavy on their conscience. Um, so Admiral Byrd was ordered to say nothing and he didn't say anything. It's the diary he wrote that was found by his son, if I'm not mistaken, a grandson, uh, about 10 years later, 10 years after his death. So what I'm going to tell you is what is purported to have been written in Admiral Byrd's diary. Now, before I tell you the story, I would only say to the listener that there would be no reason or benefit for 
this man to write what he's writing as a sort of fiction story, but true. <laughs> you know, like either it's fiction and you've got a great creative mind and you really kind of wish you were a fiction writer instead of an admiral, or you're writing it because it's true and this is your way of consoling yourself that you've been silenced and you're not sharing this information, which would completely radically change the understanding of the world we live in on, on a multitude of levels. Here's what happened. In 1947, two years after World War II, Adolf Hitler, by the way, and the so-called Nazis, the National Socialists, spent a lot of money in expeditions, and this is not disputable, down to Antarctica. This is fact. So, the biggest military expedition in the history of the world was funded, and Admiral Byrd was the top man. There was an aircraft carrier, there were battleships, there were destroyers, there were supply ships, there were aircraft. There was everything required, all of the equipment, to map Antarctica. So they went to Antarctica, and we will have records as to like the route they took and so on and so forth. When they got there, the planes that what they were using were a special kitted plane that had extra fuel tanks, were bigger than normal planes, therefore heavier, carrying all of this fuel. And in order to even try and get them to be able to take off with all of this weight, the aircraft carrier had to fly directly or, or travel directly into a headwind so you've got a wind, and it had to be going at like 25 knots or something, right? So you need to go directly into a headwind. You need to be going full throttle against it, which effectively sort of doubles the amount of lift that you would get because this plane is so weighted down with a short runway that, <laughs> let's put it this way, if it don't have enough speed when it goes over the end of the... <laughs> Your expedition's going to be real short, like that short, right? Um, so th this was an incre This was never done, what they were doing. Admiral Byrd was the pilot. He was like Charles Lindbergh, so he was nearly the first one to do the cross-Atlantic flight. Charles Lindbergh did it, but that's... He was an aviator. He was uh, a master of many things, and he was a brilliant man and an honorable man, by all accounts. Um, so... They managed to take off with the planes, and they had, I, I want to say, like nine planes that, that took off, and then each one had its own azimuth or its own trajectory, its own area of responsibility. And they all managed to take off, and they all went in their directions. And this is what Admiral Byrd said of his journey, and I'm going to really summarize it here. But... Um, as he was traveling, everything is normal, as you would expect. You're looking at a solid white uh, landmass with ice, uh, snow. Um, every 15 minutes, he would radio back, and he was doing a log of anything that was notable along the way. And this continued, and they could only go so far before they would, of course, have to double back. Because, you know, if your fuel <laughs> runs out, now you're going to be stuck in the middle of nowhere in this place where you ain't going to live, right? Um, so everything is going as planned, and every 15 minutes he's radioing back. But after I forget how long of travel, probably at least two or three hours or something like this, it was a, a significant time, um, he then begins to see discoloration in the snow, which doesn't make sense because this is supposed to be a frozen continent and you know there shouldn't be any organic material and ice is white it's just white that's all there is to it so he starts to see discoloration then he starts to see running water then he starts to see greenery then he sees what appears to be an elephant and he he's writing all this down in his log he turns the plane around lower to get a better view, and he then corrects himself. It's a mammoth, a woolly mammoth. Um, and as he's going, 
he now sees mountains and a forest. Uh, so none of this is supposed to be happening at all. I mean, none of this is supposed to be happening. And he's writing this all down. At a certain point, he loses radio contact, the instruments start acting funny, and all of his navigation goes totally haywire. Like everything. His compass heading, his altimeter, all of it. And then he ends up getting a radio signal, but it's not from the command center. It is from an unidentified uh, being who identifies Admiral Byrd by name and tells him that it's okay because his instruments are going awry. He's lost radio contact. It's okay. They know who he is, and he is fine, and they, will be t they have taken control of the plane. He lost total control of the plane, and that they will be landing him in six, seven minutes. All of this is, of course, quite extraordinary. He also ends up seeing two uh, UFOs that are not using any understood means of propulsion. And the plane that he's in now is no longer running on engine power or anything. In fact, there's no noise. There's no wind, there's no engine noise. The, the plane is seemingly being carried through the air by some unknown force, and there are two flying saucers. They look like saucers, like the classic saucers we've been told about, and they have markings. He writes us all. What is the marking? Well, here we go. That's that's the big setup for, for this. I'll get into that, but for those... There's, in that, there's, that's the mother's cross. That's got a, a swastika on it. Do I have a bigger one? I don't know if I have a bigger one here, but that one as well, that's, that's an iron cross there. That's got a, a swastika, a swastika. Now, that's not the one I'm, that's from a different period of history. We'll get into that. Anyway, the bottom line is, uh, the swastika, for those that don't know, that, that, that symbol goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's actually about the unity of life, the connectivity of all life, it's actually a beautiful symbol. So a bit ironic that uh, there's swastikas on these flying saucers which are using technology that we don't know of, and his vessel is no longer flying on petrol and engine power. In fact, it's silent, and it's being taken by some unseen force. Indeed, these beings flying in these vessels uh, are escorting him, and the vessel then lands, and it's like an elevator shaft. It literally, like, like it's just lowered to the ground, uh, and it connects to the ground and lands with a, just a little bump. And when they land, this vessel is also landed near, and it opens up, and these beans step out, and Admiral Bird writes that they are very tall, they are also blonde, and um, they uh, identify in a few, a few moments as the Ariani. Now, this is all very interesting. Swastikas and Ariani and blonde hair. blonde hair, and they had blue eyes as well. <laughs> I think Adolf talked about a master race, blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, Adolf did not have blonde hair or blue eyes and many Germans do not but some do but wait anyway these individuals identify as Ariani and they have blue eye, uh, uh, blue eyes and blonde hair human yes with human features um, and attractive apparently like they, they weren't like um, hook nose Shylocks I guess they they, they looked <laughs> They were, they were good looking. You know? um, they order him to get out of the plane and to open up its compartment, and he does so. And they then take him in some like device that has no means of propulsion that he can see, and they tell him uh, that, to leave the co-pilot, so the co-pilot has to stay back while they take Admiral Byrd, and they take this transport device which literally transports them towards 
a city of crystal, he described it, with lighting, lighting that literally came from the walls, from no identifiable source. Um, crystal buildings unlike anything he's ever seen. And when they get to it, they actually, the city, they go down into the city. And that is where they take him into these magnificent uh, places. And they explain to him that their civilization is many thousands of years in advance of humanity. And that is why they have all of these different technologies. And uh, that uh, they live within the inner earth here or part of the earth. The earth that we have been told is a ball. Um, I don't know, aliens apparently, according to this Admiral Crazy Admiral Bird, who's some fantastical uh, fiction writer, um, apparently, whatever, the aliens are here. So they explain to him that they have been um, commanded to bring him to the master. So he gets taken to this amazing uh, building, and he's told to uh, wait, the master will be. He doesn't wait long at all, and then he is summoned into this uh, office. Again, a magnificent place with a big table, at the end of which is clearly uh, a man who is of wisdom. I forget exactly how to describe You know, we all know when we meet somebody who's got that special kind, exudes something special, like, wow, this, this is an amazing character. Um, uh, of slightly more age, um, but not looking old and frail, just older, wiser. And he is very cordial, and he asks uh, uh, Admiral Byrd to sit down, and effectively what the master says is that Admiral Byrd was brought there because of his implacable character, his integrity, um, and he was chosen to be given a message to take back to his master. And effectively, what the Ariani were wanting to pass on through Admiral Byrd was that the tinkering of atomic bombs is something that has repercussions beyond just the terrestrial world that we know. And it's ironic because the biggest part of the reason why I wore this is because August 6th is coming, Hiroshima. It was that event that motivated the Ariani, according to this understanding of history, um, to feel compelled to reveal that they are here because that nuclear technology doesn't just threaten humanity, it threatens them. They don't live millions of light years away. They're here. But maybe across the ice wall that Antarctica might be, much closer than we are led to believe, well, that would make sense that they would be concerned because if the aliens all live like millions of light years away, that's what we're told, right? Like the sun is millions of light years away, right? If they're not, that's the closest one. So if all the, if they're so far away, do you really think these fireworks we set off over here are going to affect them millions of light years away? I mean, I would have thought it'd be like nothing, right? But if they're that much closer, if maybe we share this space with some other beings that we don't know of yet. Was this an interview that he done? It was not an interview. It, it was literally a sit down with the master so that the master could yeah, tell him. Did he do an interview? Can anybody watch this or read up in this? Yeah, the, what you have is the, the, the telling of the diary. Uh, and so there's different people who have made different views and you'll get different perspectives. But... You can actually get the, the printing of the diary and read it for yourself and then decide for yourself. I see a lot of the pieces of the puzzle being filled in by this. A lot. A lot. 